Okay, I think most people have joined by now. Uh, I'd just like to welcome everyone to this webinar by the Norwegian ME Association and Workwell Foundation. And um, I'm not quite sure how many of our audience today speak English and how many speak Norwegian, so I'll just try to speak English and see how it goes. Um, first, a few housekeeping rules. Uh, the presentation will take about 40 minutes and there will be time for questions and answers afterwards. So then I think I've said everything I need to say and all I need to do is to hand it over to Mark and Todd and they will introduce themselves. Thank you so much. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, where, wherever you are. Uh, my name is Todd Davenport. I'm really privileged to be joined by uh, Mark Van Ness for this talk uh, entitled Heart Rate Biofeedback for ME from Physiology to Practice. Uh, I want to acknowledge um, the ME Association, Norweg Norwegian ME Association for having us. Thank you so much and thank you for all your efforts to raise awareness uh, of this disease. Uh, and also to acknowledge our other team members um, uh, in the WorkWell Foundation, uh, our Executive Director, Stacey Stevens, uh, Dr. Chris Snell, and also Jared Stevens, uh, who uh, are not presenting today, uh, but are definitely, definitely in the team. Um, so with that, uh, uh, here's what we'll be talking about today. We'll be talking about post-exertional malaise and post-exertional symptom exacerbation, which is the why behind heart rate. Uh, biofeedback. We'll talk about the nuts and bolts, which is the what. Um, and then we'll get into the how, which are some case applications uh, and some specific tips for patients and their clinicians, followed by a panel discussion. So we're going to do our best to hold ourselves to about 40 to 45 minutes of talking to leave ourselves about 15 minutes at the end for, for, Q for questions and answers. Do please use the Q&A function. Uh, we will try and monitor the Q&A uh, throughout uh, in order to uh, be able to, to provide answers in real time. So with that, uh, Mark, take it away. Thanks, Todd. As, as Todd mentioned, um, the why of this heart rate biofeedback presentation is to try to avoid uh, exacerbating symptoms, whether you refer to that as post-exertional malaise, post-exertional symptom ex exacerbation, uh, post-exertional neuromuscular, or, uh, neuroimmune exhaustion, uh, systemic exertional intolerance. If you've experienced it, you know exactly what we're talking about. And avoiding post-exertional malaise uh, is, is the key. So one part of that is recognizing uh, that exertion, whether that's uh, usually physical, but oftentimes mental or emotional exertion, can have a fairly profound effect on the illness. And for many people, it worsens symptoms. Uh, in some cases, if it's severe enough, uh, it can also uh, cause new symptoms to appear uh, and recognizing those and then working backwards. So the goal obviously is to get a heart rate monitor, utilize it appropriately to avoid post-exertional malaise. The reason for this, as you know, is energy production is not normal in MECFS. Um, the, the, the ability of... Uh, the air, oxygen in the air to get to cells for aerobic metabolism is impaired both in ME and in long COVID. Um, lung problems, particularly in long COVID, but then we know cardiovascular abnormalities in ME and then aerobic metabolism uh, abnormalities in ME make it very challenging to utilize aerobic metabolism during higher intensity activities uh, of daily living. Uh, and if you can avoid uh, taxing that system, you can avoid symptoms. Um, Stacy Stevens at the Workwell Foundation has uh, made this flow chart to help uh, each of us identify what are post-exertional malaise symptoms. What are the earliest symptoms that you identify? And, and she's provided a list that people have told us before. I think it's important for each individual to figure out that there is usually a symptom that occurs very early on uh, as a direct result of uh, overdoing it. And you can recognize that symptom to try to avoid either short-term or long-term PEMP symptoms. So the short-term symptoms tend to be, you know, a few days after overdoing it. And one of the challenges is once you get into this short-term phase, you realize that you've overdone it and you need to go back and recognize what it was that caused that so you can avoid any prolonged symptoms. Um, one question that we ask 
uh, our patients is do you experience severe fatigue with at least three symptoms? So the, the feelings of unwell, weakness, uh, uh, and, and acceleration of the fatigue, um, uh, localized pain, um, oftentimes fever, uh, flu-like symptoms. Uh, and, it, and if it took you more than one day to recover, you need to identify the activities that led to that so that you can avoid those. And heart rate monitoring is a wonderful way to be able to do that. The QR codes that Todd's inserted um, uh, at the lower right side will take you to the WorkWell um, website, which has a little bit more detail on some of this stuff. I'm sure many of you have heard uh, over and over what are PEM symptoms. Um, you've seen diagrams that help uh, identify what are the most significant uh, exertional symptoms um, that are associated with that. But once you identify those PEM symptoms, you can use your heart rate monitoring to help identify that. And for, for those of you that have not already done this, I just want to go through the nuts and bolts quickly. Many of you are already using heart rate monitoring, and, and maybe you'll be able to get uh, a few additional um, maybe uh, tips that you can try to improve your capability of heart rate monitoring. So the idea here is to try to delimit the activities where your heart rate goes above uh, AT as an abbreviation for anaerobic threshold. So we're gonna we're gonna show you uh, or help identify ways of figuring out what your anaerobic threshold is, so that you can avoid spending too much time above that because that's what leads to post exertional exacerbation. So knowing your heart rate can help you recognize that, and that's the first step um, is getting a good heart rate monitor that you can utilize. Um, and you'll probably get advice from a lot of different places of what is the best one to use. Um, the best one for you is one that has uh, ease and wearableness, one that provides the feedback that you need to avoid PEM. Um, Todd, I'm looking at a, a paper that Todd did, um, and uh, it, it showed that most ME patients are using an Apple Watch, which I have on one of my wrists. Uh, Fitbit is another common one. Uh, Garmin, uh, both Stacy and I uh, also use a Whoop strap. Um, but the idea there is to know your heart rate throughout the day and then keep track on the other side here. What are good days? Um, and then what are PEM days? So you've heard of the good day, bad day phenomena. The bad day is where you're experiencing post-exertional malaise. So find a heart rate monitor that, that can work for you. Um, we often recommend that students use the Polar style with the heart rate strap. Um, those tend to have um, the best sensitivity for picking up heart rate but uh, they're also the least comfortable to wear. And a lot of times people don't like to, to sleep in those. Obviously, many of those are difficult to shower in and they're just uncomfortable. Um, and so they opt for um, oftentimes, like I mentioned, the Apple Watch. Um, and then the, the pickup on some of the wrist mounted straps aren't bad, like Fitbit, um, like a Whoop strap. Um, Epson made one that was pretty good. Um, the Aura Ring actually has um, some shortcomings in terms of um, picking up heart rate, but find something that you can get immediate feedback, whether that's utilizing feedback to your phone, if you look at that more frequently enough, or feedback on a wrist mounted device so that you can know during activities what your heart rate is, and then hopefully be able to look back at those activity, excuse me, activities um, to see what impact those have in your daily life. So there's, there's two most important variables um, to figure out. First, determine your resting heart rate. Um, and the, this little baby waking up here, um, the, the best heart rate you're gonna get, the most accurate measure of resting heart rate, is when you wake up in the morning, you haven't gotten out of bed, you haven't done ever, any significant activity yet. Um, and I also recommend recording that. Uh, oftentimes people like to have a device that records it for them, or you can put that in a journal so that you can track that. Um, I'm just showing an example here of uh, one patient that tracked their heart rate over about, um, this looks like about two months here. And the nice thing about being able to track your resting heart rate is there are periods of time where when heart rate is decreasing, that's a sign of good pacing strategies. Um, you can see there are days where resting heart rate is elevated um, here. Those often follow days where you've overdone it. Um, the athlete term for overdoing it is overreaching. It has the same application for athletes as it does for those of us with ME. And then days where, and here you can see this downward trend during this entire month where resting heart rate is going down. This would be a sign of um, this patient doing pacing very, very well. And resting heart rate is not just returning to what is considered a normal level, it actually is decreasing. 
Besides resting heart rate, knowing what your heart rate is at the anaerobic threshold uh, gives you an upper limit that you try to delimit, that you try to avoid. Um, if any of you have done cardiopulmonary exercise testing, you know that you can you get uh, a measure of anaerobic threshold. And the CPAP results use um, the, the breathing and CO2 production to very carefully identify anaerobic threshold. Um, and those, like I said, perfect if you have that. Many people don't. And so you want to try to find uh, an intensity where you can stay within your aerobic capabilities. So anaerobic threshold is an intensity of activity where the anaerobic contribution starts to become significant because of shortcomings in aerobic metabolism. One of the most common ways to do that, um, a very, very good starting place, is once you've found your resting heart rate, add 15 beats for that and use that as a reference. Many people will complain, my gosh, that, that is much too low. I, I, I programmed my watch to go off at resting plus 15, and it's just too low of an activity intensity. Um, but use that as a, a starting reference. If if you can delimit activities um, to where that heart rate monitors prior and that feedback, you're probably going to uh, avoid PAM. Um, start with that valley, and then I put here knowledgeably adjust. If if you're not experiencing symptoms, you may be able to adjust that number upward. Um, but but do it gently and um, continue to monitor, and it's going to be helpful. Um, the heart rate does give you feedback to stop doing activities. Uh, literally, uh, whether it's holiday shopping um, and you're walking around and you're enjoying some time and your heart rate monitor goes off, it may be time to sit down if you can, or even lie down and put your feet up for a period of time, let your heart rate go back down. Um, sometimes people use this talk test if breathlessness um, is one of their first symptoms, if they're starting to feel fatigue in their joints, uh, onset of headache, lightheadedness, all of those kinds of things, that may be a sign um, that you need to stop. But use that anaerobic threshold or that resting plus 15 as a sign that you need to delimit activity. And then start trying to, to understand what activities lead to post-exertional malaise. And in the short term, for our memories, I think it's sometimes easily to identify, but longer term, especially if you don't have symptoms that arise for two to three day post, you'll be asking yourself, gosh, what was it that led to this post-exertional response? Uh, was it standing for a period of time um, while I was uh, shopping or working around the house? Or could it be something as simple as um, showering while I stood up? Did that lead to um, symptoms? Some helpful hints, and there's a lot more of these on the WorkWell site. Journaling to keep track of your heart rate, using the audible uh, alarms uh, or feedback can help you become a better attuned to what are those early symptoms and using heart rate to be able to identify that. One of the most significant difficulties that we have is the uh, confounding variable where uh, patients are either taking a beta blocker or they experience uh, post uh, uh, postural orthostatic tachycardia symptom. And that's where typically a change in posture will lead to a very profound increase in heart rate. And we we don't we want to refer that as noise, but that increase in heart rate typically isn't associated with an increase in heart, in activity. So you have to know is this an activity that's causing a rise in heart rate, or is that big increase in heart rate the result of POTS? Um, and I think um, understanding which is which is is going to be helpful. If you have a, a wrist mounted device, uh, oftentimes you'll have places where heart rate will either drop out or sometimes there'll be spikes recognizing, um, asking yourself, is this indicative of uh, real activity or is it the result of an arrhythmia like uh, uh, postural orthostasis? I'm gonna stop sharing here because what Todd's gonna do is um, try to give us uh, an idea of how this would apply to an individual case study. So Todd, you can take it. All right, thanks, Mark. I wanted to make sure I wasn't sharing my holiday shopping list with everyone. <laughs> it's too many windows open. Um, every time I listen to Mark talk through the rationale for heart rate biofeedback, I learned something new. Uh, so hopefully hopefully you picked up some new new knowledge, new, new questions. I see a few in the, in the Q&A, looking forward to addressing those. 
my role in the webinar today is to discuss a case application. And the case application really is a combination of two or three patients uh, to protect uh, the identities of the innocent um, and to demonstrate the key concepts of uh, applying that great information that, that Mark just went through. Um, so we'll, without further ado, uh, we'll move forward. So the question is always, this: many of these physiological concepts are so nice and elegant and easy to understand once they're explained and kind of noodle through, um, but what do you do with it? And so what we what, what our team has come up with is this concept of first aid for energy systems. This idea that the aerobic energy system is not working and it requires stabilization, much like you would put a fractured bone in a cast. Um, and so similar to the construct of first aid in at least the US and the UK, uh, we, we talk about the three C's. We talk about check, call, and care. And you know, in, in first aid, we we check, we check the patient, we then call the, the medical team. Uh, and then and then we provide supportive care. Um, so the first first aid for energy systems isn't isn't necessarily curative, but it provides the opportunity for stabilization. And it relies on this concept of analepsis. Uh, analepsis, which is strengthening and 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 and, um, and restfulness and and being able to restore through that uh, instead of so much rehabilitation, which is loading uh, and trying to um, to restore. Uh, you know, tissue integrity uh, and metabolic functioning through loading. The, the goal is to improve quality of life, to, um, to improve uh, the predictive power of, of, of at any point, to be able to know uh, the quantity of energy you may have in the future, your need to rest, um, and also sets the environment for potential, potential functional recovery and improvement of your functional baseline uh, and also the chance to pursue additional testing uh, and additional supportive interventions. Uh, so this whole idea of first aid becomes, we think, important. This is from a, a blog post in the Journal of Orthopedic and Sports Physical Therapy that summarizes the approach, this whole idea of, of the rationale for pacing, um, you know, uh, rooted in the idea that, um, that, that it's difficult to maintain energy balance in uh, ME, um, because of kind of verifiable physiological um, deficits that occur after exertion, uh, consistent with that post-exertional symptomatology, um, asking people to then prioritize their top symptoms, to monitor them throughout the day and across days and across weeks, paying attention to triggers, keeping a symptom log, monitoring heart rates and activity intensities, and then finding a way to set an alarm um, when you go over your target heart rate. And then the final column there is plan. So just some basic ideas about how to pace things to do um, uh, in, in, that, in that, that last column there. So our case is uh, a 45 year old woman uh, who presents for a telehealth visit. Uh, this is a person who uh, decided on a video appointment to avoid the need to come into the office. Um, mainly because leaving the house caused her to crash. Um, and so she had an eight year history of progressive fatigue, of cognitive dis dysfunction. She identified this as like uh, trying to think through jello is the way that she put it. Uh, sleep disturbances, uh, including short sleeping, waking frequently, uh, starting to get her days and nights turned around uh, where she's more active at night than during the day. And also severe generalized body aches. And, and this is this all occurred after a brief viral illness uh, of an unclear etiology. She also had dizziness with positional changes uh, or prolonged standing. Uh, wasn't sure what to do about that. Had a hard time preparing a simple meal because she was she, she got dizzy within a few minutes of, of starting that process. And she had a really limited ability to engage uh, with her friends, uh, with, with her father, uh, to be able to visit her father, uh, and also to work uh, as a physician. Um, she slept all the time, but she never really felt rested, um, and so she did have unrefreshing sleep. Um, so she had she had consults with uh, with infectious disease. Sorry about the pediatric piece <laughs> that that got that got snuck in there. Uh, but she'd seen rheumatology, cardiology, and psychiatry. Uh, she had an antibody panel that was positive for a prior Epstein Barr infection. 
Uh, she had concern for depression. Uh, her NASA lean test was results were consistent with POTS. And she'd been trying to do the modified CHOP protocol for POTS, but she'd been having a hard time doing the exercise. And so her goal was really to learn uh, more about ME to feel better and eventually in some form or fashion to be able to go back to her prior work. So there are a few subjective findings that I'm interested in as a physical therapist, um, specifically interested in lightheadedness, dizziness, racing heart, chest discomfort with position changes. These give me an idea of whether there may be postural, postural uh, orthostasis uh, 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 that's occurring. Uh, and she's already indicated yes in the initial history, so I didn't have to ask that question. That was sort of asked and answered. Uh, I asked her if she had a feeling of head heaviness, pressure, arm numbness, and tingling because I was interested in whether she might have uh, symptoms and signs consistent with craniovertebral instability, uh, and, she, and, and so that was no. And I asked her what her top symptoms were, and her top symptoms were fatigue, but of course it's not just fatigue, it's fatigue plus plus, it's fatigue uh, to the point where there's just nothing left. Uh, you're bonked, there's nothing there. Um, Brain fog, again, thinking through jello, and then the unrefreshing sleep. And then she also sort of tied for third, let me know that palpitations and dizziness were problematic uh, because she wasn't able to stand for, for very long to be able to do her tasks. I really like to get an idea of what people know about this disease because there's so much good information out there from patient groups like, uh, uh, like, the, like the Norwegian ME Association. Um, and and others uh, that that it's 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 hard it's hard not to find good information if you're looking for it. Um, she read about it on the internet, kind of undis un, sort of un, undifferentiated websites. Um, seemed like it could be the diagnosis, but she wasn't really sure. Uh, she was still in, interested in an infectious disease consultation and an, an, an additional uh, infectious disease consultation just because she felt so crummy that she. She couldn't, couldn't get over this idea that maybe a chronic infection was involved and maybe it could have been. Um, and so then the, I also like to ask, what do you what do you think about acting on MECFS as a presumptive diagnosis and seeing if it helps? Mainly because one of the main issues associated with uh, care for ME is uh, the case definition criteria require a diagnosis of exclusion. And that diagnosis of exclusion can take a long time uh, to, to come about. And so um, if we identify post-exertional malaise or post-exertional symptom exacerbation, we can, we can treat presumptively um, using energy system first aid uh, concepts while um, additional testing and intervention is being pursued. She said, sure, it couldn't hurt. That was good enough for me. Uh, objective findings are challenging in a video visit, but she wasn't really in any apparent respiratory distress. She was on camera. She was sitting reclined. She looked really, really tired. Eyes were sort of at half mast. Uh, we were meeting about mid morning. This was probably about the time that she was trying to get up and going with her day after having been up a share of the night. Um, and her range of motion, I asked her to kind of do cervical, you know, rotation flexion extension side bend, it didn't re reproduce any neck pain or headache or pressure, which was good. So it allowed me to kind of knock down on my list, uh, concern for craniovertebral instability. Um, so the treatment really was providing information. There's a lot of health coaching that goes along with, uh, with this. Um, uh, heart rate by heart rate biofeedback. It, heart rate biofeedback is not just a one-time thing. Here's a tip sheet, go go enjoy your life. It is, uh, it is adoption of a health behavior. Uh, it's adoption of that health behavior. It's getting the technology together. It's using the technology. It's interpreting the numbers. It's, uh, understanding what the, what the, what the numbers mean across different contexts, uh, when your symptoms are better and worse. Um, so there's a lot of follow-up, a lot of opportunity for follow-up, uh, for, for coaching on this. And so we, we did link to both the US CDC materials as well as the WorkWell Foundation materials. Uh, we discussed how to obtain a heart rate sensor. She decided on the polar verity sense. Uh, the chest strap was too intense, but she liked the idea of a, of a strap. Um, so proximally situated strap on her upper arm worked really well for her. And she paired the app to the uh, proprietary polar app, but then also uh, we used a third party app that's a free app uh, called HeartBuddy. HeartBuddy tends to give you the opportunity to uh, set alarms at 
at maximum heart rates. And so it's a pretty easy app to use. Uh, so I, I liked that because the Polar app tends to be kind of crowded for people with brain fog. So a simpler app was, was, was appealing. So she agreed to create a daily journal. She journaled for a couple of weeks. Um, just before she got up in the morning, she, she, she kind of wrote down her heart rate, which would go to her resting heart rate during her morning self-care routine, during whatever activity she chose to look at for the day in the morning, just as in the manner of experimentation, some self-selected activity in the afternoon, and then while she was resting in the afternoon, and then before going to sleep at night. Uh, just to kind of give a sampling throughout the day. Now, the Heart Buddy app, of course, is recording moment-to-moment -moment heart rates throughout the day. So if there were spikes or moments of interest or th things she forgot to write down, she could always go back and look at her app uh, to see if um, to see what her heart rate was. So we, we met again in four weeks. So she did get her monitor together. She began me measuring her heart rate. And her heart rates were 62 in the morning before she got up. She noticed that they were lower overnight. They were like, like low 50s overnight, but by right before she got up, it was at 62. So that's what we used as the basis for her, her threshold that I'll talk about in a moment. Um, getting out of bed, she was at 150. Uh, now 150 is jogging. <laughs> so, so that was just getting up and standing up when, when she first uh, when she first got up. Now, after a few minutes, it reduced down to about 70. But it was up again to 150, which again is a is a really that's jogging when she's dressing in the morning uh, and showering during her morning meal down to 100. So that's a brisk walk. Uh, her afternoon reading was even higher than her morning meal, which was um, which is 110. Uh, she was able to rest to get it down to 80. But you can see that that's higher than than her morning uh, reading. And then her, her walking for the, the modified shot protocol was 145 to 155 or higher. Um, and so this was really demonstrative and helpful to, um, to start um, getting an understanding of her moment to moment uh, in activity intensities uh, and sort of what her heart rate is doing at different times of the day. So in the manner of treatment on the second visit, we started to set some uh, parameters. So we went rest plus 15. So it was 62 plus 15 is 77. And so I asked her to set her app to 77 beats a minute. And we talked about ways that she might reduce the physical and cognitive load of her self-care and her household activities. Uh, also advised for lower extremity and abdominal compression for rising in the, in the morning um, uh, and, and, and throughout the day. Uh, she, she chose to use uh, Spanx. Um, that's not an endorsement, but <laughs> shapewear provides mild compression. It's integrated, it's contoured for comfort, and it happens to be pretty good for this. Um, and then um, ask the patient to write down activities that were challenging to reduce her heart rate uh, for, for discussion uh, in the next session. We continue to meet through video and email uh, about every six weeks for a total of a year. Um, so I want to give the idea for any clinicians who may be listening in that, you know, this is this is not sort of, you know, get 12 visits uh, and uh, approved. And we, we see people three times a week for four weeks. Um, you know, this is this is a situation where prolonged follow-up is required. Um, lots of problems, lots of collaborative problem solving, lots of up and ups and downs. Uh, and this really is a health coaching uh, model. Uh, and so I think this is a this is an opportunity for we clinicians to rethink what we do uh, and make sure that we are there for our patients uh, instead of sort of there uh, when the money is. So our one year outcomes were that she was able to spend most of the day out of bed, but she's still doing two breathing breaks daily. I was asking her to do two diaphragmatic breathing sessions, uh, supine um, with her legs elevated and uh, in a low stimulation environment, uh, just to stimulate, uh, kind of reduce sympathetic stimulation, uh, bring in more parasympathetic tone. Uh, her heart rates were more appropriate for activities, and so she wasn't seeing the spikes uh, as frequently. Um, she had stopped doing the modified shot protocol, basically at visit two, and never went back and still saw her heart rates normalize. Uh, she was able to stay under her heart rate threshold more consistently, mainly because her resting heart rates uh, reduced uh, and gave her more beats under her threshold. 
She was able to get eight hours of fairly continuous sleep at night, but still unrefreshing sleep, still uh, disturbed sleep, still tended towards um, turning around days and nights, but was doing better, uh, was was um, exposing herself to natural light first thing in the morning, which which was helpful to um, to start to normalize her circadian functioning. And then uh, she was able to bathe and prepare a meal in the same day without exacerbation. She started doing some cognitive work of journaling, um, not just not just journaling heart rates, but journaling um, think her thoughts and and things in life and and curiosities and and so forth. She was able to do some really light morning stretching, uh, and she was able to walk about a half a mile to sit at a park most days out of the week without exacerbation. And she was really considering. Uh, how she might be able to work, you know, at least part time. Not ready yet, but um, getting getting to thinking about how it is that that might that might happen. So the QR code on the screen points to a heart rate biofeedback fact sheet, and this fact sheet um, really talks a lot about what what Mark and I have gone over. Uh, today, uh, and in the manner of a summary. So, so hopefully, this summary is helpful to, um, you know, give you a resource after the the webinar is completed. In addition to, of course, the webinar recording, um, and it it ha and again it, it has how to determine the resting heart rate, uh, the re re the heart rate at anaerobic threshold. You know what the activity limits should be. Um, how to identify and differentiate among the various symptoms of post exertional malaise. Uh, it talks about how, when to stop activities and how to tie activities to perceived exertion uh, as, as, an, as a secondary uh, self-assessment to, um, to heart rate biofeedback. Um, so uh, again, hopefully, hopefully that's a good one-page summary. And then here's a, a one-page tip sheet uh, that, that we put together to help patients and clinicians get on the same page. Uh, with this with this condition and with this model of care, this energy system first aid concept. So the first um, key feature of energy system first aid is again check. And in checking, you know we're trying to assess for post exertional malaise, as Mark talked about earlier. Uh, and so there are there are a few ways that you that you can evidence based questions you can ask as a clinician and uh, evidence based questions you can ask yourself um, as a patient. Does it take more than a day to recover? Do you feel unwell, weak, don't sleep well, or have pain when recovering from activity? Are you feeling limited in your ability to do your normal daily tasks after an activity? And does exercise and activity positively affect you? So for the first three bullet points, if the answer is yes, and if the last answer to the last bullet point is no, then the needle moves towards thinking about the presence of post-exertional malaise. Um, and so again, those are you know, that's probably the a, a synopsis of about four studies that we've done to look into the diagnostic accuracy of questions to um, identify post-exertional malaise compared to features of deconditioning. The second piece is really kind of skipping down to care. Uh, what do we do? Um, so I, we took that one page uh, sheet from earlier and boiled it down to four bullet points <laughs> in, in one page. Uh, about the basics of pacing uh, and heart rate biofeedback. And then uh, also other supportive interventions that, that we use to enhance circulation, uh, to, um, to reduce sympathetic tone. Um, so, you know, monitoring oxygen saturation if a pulmonary pathology is, expect, is, is suspected, uh, such as our, um, our folks with ME uh, who, who, who came to ME from, uh, from long COVID. Uh, also to increase venous return, uh, not only from the lower extremities, but also from the uh, the gut, from the splanchnic circulation, so abdominal compression. Uh, shape, shapewear tends to work pretty well as an integrated solution. Uh, also to increase hydration because of the evidence for decrease in plasma volumes uh, in patients with ME. Uh, so increasing water and electrolytes and decreasing diuretic intake, uh, such as caffeine. And then two to three rest breaks in a low stimulation environment um, daily, including diaphragmatic breathing and either supine hook lying or uh, with the lower extremities sort of straight and up in the uh, and, and, and sort of up and supported um, above the heart. Uh, and, uh, and, and again, doing that diaphragmatic breathing to, to reduce sympathetic tone. 
So um, really, we've we've talked about heart rate biofeedback and pacing. I'm sure we could do and do a whole other webinar on, on many of these other supportive interventions, and you know, kind of thinking we might. But with that, uh, I would love to open the floor, such as it is, such as we have one on Zoom, for for any questions and additions from Mark. Thanks. Well, thank you for a very interesting talk. Uh, I see there's a few questions about heart rate variability, and Mark mentioned in one of the answers there that he had some extra slides on heart rate variability, and I th do you think you have time for them? That would be very interesting to see. Yeah. So many of you are familiar. Uh, the questions obviously showed that you are familiar and, and have had questions about using HRV. Um, for those of you that haven't, heart rate variability is is a very integrated measure that looks at the beat to beat fluctuations. And heart rate variability is is different than resting heart rate in that higher beat to beat variable is more desirable, um, and lower beat to beat variable is less desirable. Todd, go forward um, one slide, I believe. Um, try one more. Um, this, this is an example of um, where physically active, these are examples from three different individuals. They're using HRV as a measure of how much activity, kind of like I showed you earlier with resting heart rate, um, where resting heart rate is elevated after days where you've overdone it. And I noticed one person asked in the Q&A, um, what's a significant resting heart rate increase? And we usually answer that with a 10% increase. HRV, uh, it, it, in contrast, a lower HRV is a sign of poor recovery. So uh, in the example on the left side, um, the person had uh, an 80 uh, milliseconds HRV and it dipped on Friday and Saturday down into the 50s and the 40s. And that's a sign that they had overdone it. Um, and then you can see if they adequately recovered, HRV comes back up. So a higher HRV um, is a better use of that. Um, Todd, I think I had one more picture on HRV. Can you go forward one more? So just like we used resting heart rate as a measure of recovery, you can also track your HRV on a day-to-day -day basis to see if you're doing better. This is that same patient that I showed resting heart rate, where their resting heart rate went down for a month where they were doing better pacing. Their HRV went up um, during a month where they did better pacing, and that's a sign of recovery. One of the big problems we have with HRV is it's such a noisy variable, uh, very, very dependent on when that information is collected. Um, Stacy uses an app on her phone uh, and a heart rate strap um, and measures it for a period of time just after waking. Um, the subject that was using uh, the, the data here, uh, it's measured during their REM sleep, uh, during the night. Um, the, then, and you have to you have to really get comfortable with figuring out a, a, the same period of time during the day under the same conditions with the same posture, uh, because HRV has the potential to be a noisy variable, but it can be very very useful. Todd, if you back up a couple of slides, not just. Um, this one, yeah, not just uh, the the singular number um, that oftentimes is given either with an Apple Watch or a Garmin or a Whoop strap. Uh, in the lab, you can parse those numbers a bit more um, to get instead of just in the in the time scale and a frequency scale, you can get measures of what is the sympathetic or the parasympathetic contribution, and those I think are going to become much more useful to patients with ME to be able to identify when their parasympathetic tonus is decreased. That's a sign of poor recovery and onset of um, and symptoms. And, and that feedback can be uh, much easier to gather if you can get a good HRV. So I, I hope that was, that's kind of a, a HRV tutorial um, <laughs> quickly, but that their heart rate variability can be very useful. It just can be difficult to get. And as as a clinician, just to piggyback on that great content there, Mark, um, I, I've I sort of, as a clinician, I teach heart rate biofeedback first because it's more intuitive. It's uh, a little, it's easier to tie to moment to moment exertions and activities, and easier to use in journaling. Um, but then later on, we graduate into using heart rate variability 
sampling for two to three minutes in the morning. Um, again, trying to pay attention carefully to posture um, and try and make the same, make conditions as, as similar as possible because it is such a noisy variable. But what heart rate variability gives you is the potential to look at uh, sort of near-term trends, uh, whereas heart, heart rate itself gives you an idea of your moment-to-moment -moment, um, activity, moment-to-moment -moment exertion. Um, so I, I kind of think about it like this, um, that using heart rate is a little bit like predicting the weather by looking out the window. And heart rate variability is like trying to predict the weather by looking at the 10-day forecast. So you'll notice that heart rate variability is kind of a, is kind of, it will show you non-intuitive things. So your heart rates may trend lower and your heart rate variability may trend higher. So that, that suggests that you're, you're functioning well. Um, but you also may have relatively low heart rates, but decreasing heart rate variability, you're just not symptomatic yet. And what that's telling you is that it's the rain's on the way, but the rain's not here yet. And so you have the opportunity to sort of change your behavior uh, and do some more pacing and resting in response to this information. And similarly, you may feel really crummy uh, as a patient, but your heart rate variability is looking really good, but you, your, heart, your heart rates themselves are dysregulated and you feel crummy. And what, that, what, what I've noticed that suggests is that you may be coming out of your crash. You're turning a corner, hang in there. You're doing the right things, keep doing the right things. You're, you're, you're turning a corner. Uh, and so the, again, you know, trying to throw all of this at a patient at once, when you throw cognitive dysfunction on top of that can be really hard. Um, and so to the clinicians in the group, make sure that you, you have, you have people uh, really comfortable with monitoring and using biofeedback methods based on heart rate, because they're much more intuitive uh, before throwing heart rate variability uh, into the mix. And what, what you're, what you're hearing are expert patients who we learn from every day, uh, who've been doing heart rate biofeedback and uh, are graduating into using and interpreting heart rate variability, but just bearing in mind that not everyone who walks into our clinic might be at that level. Uh, Jared, if I can add, add one thing, Maria, Elizabeth, and Sunil, uh, excuse me, Karen, uh, had, had some questions about the numbers um, that are used for heart rate variability. Um, in this this picture that that Todd has up here, it shows that you can use a variety of different numbers because this is it's it's actually out spectral data. Typically, um, in answer to Maria's question about using an aura ring, um, the nice thing about aura or whoop or wearing your polar strap or garment strap chest strap overnight is you get a more consistent. HRV measurement, um, especially with aura, because it's going to collect it during a particular phase during sleep. So that's good. Um, one of the the difficulties of of HRV is the the day to day variability. And just I'm just going to repeat what Todd said. Um, get good at using your resting heart rate and your heart rate during activities. Uh, that's going to be a much more useful variable. Um, and then HRV would be like advanced heart rate biofeedback. Um, then, and this, just to one other question, Elizabeth, the numbers, what are the different numbers? Typically the, the singular number that you get off a device is, is, a, is part of the time specter rather than the frequency specter. And it's a root mean squared of the variability. Um, and it's taken uh, on some of the apps that you do transiently, where you put your finger over your phone, or you get feedback from a, a strap or a whoop or aura, um, it's taking it for maybe as long as five minutes or as short as one to two minutes. Um, and so that's that may be why you're getting variability from one device uh, to another if they're using um, the root mean squared or on that picture that Todd's showing, low frequency power as a ratio of high frequency power. And that's a that's in the power spectra rather than the time spectra. So choose a device, uh, use one to compare on a day-to-day -day basis. Everyone's gonna be a little different with these, the specifics of these numbers. So not only is there variability in the measurement, in the measurement of heart rate variability across devices uh, and what numbers are expressed, but you know, people may have different different numbers um, just across using the same using the same device. Uh, and so it, it's hard to say, um, what HRV number should I get? 
Um, that's that's always a, a fraught question. And so we go, it's because it's just different for everyone uh, at this point. And so uh, I take a very individualized approach to identifying what, what those numbers and trends look like. Uh, I have people basically keep track of their, um, their morning or, or overnight heart rate variabilities and then give themselves a red, yellow, or a green light. A uh, red light day would be a crash day. A yellow light day would be like a day that probably needed some rest. And a green light day was a was a favorable day, a better a better day. Uh, and so then we can go back and look at the red, yellow, and green light and cross-reference against the numbers uh, and figure out what those numbers ought to be for individual patients. So there are ways that you can use journaling techniques to identify uh, the number, but that number may be different for everyone. I noticed there were quite a few questions about POTS and uh, orthostatic intolerance. Uh, there's some people who are saying they use beta blockers uh, because of POTS and that it lowers their heart rate. So how should they find their resting heart rate plus 15, was it, uh, when their heart rate is being lowered? Or how do you work that out? Do you want to take that, Todd? That's that's kind of a it's a challenging question. Yeah, I've I've worked a lot with people uh, on beta blockers, and there there is sort of a the, of course the way they work is through is through normalizing and reducing heart rates, but th they're usually normalizing and reducing heart rates at heart rates above intensities that we're interested in, um, and so above that ventilatory anaerobic threshold. There's an old paper. Uh, suggesting that that VAT heart rates aren't um, affected by beta blockers uh, during incremental exercise tasks. I, I need to dig that up and look at it again. But um, you know, there may be some need to revise downward um, if you're taking a dosage of beta blocker that's sufficient to have an effect be you know, below the, the ventilatory anaerobic threshold. You can still push yourself into a crash uh, because of uh, exceeding your your metabolism. Um, there are heart rate formulas for uh, identifying maximal heart rate in people on beta blockers that have been that have been derived, and so those also might be useful for uh, for looking at, at threshold numbers. But generally speaking, the rest plus fifteen beats work, has worked well uh, for for my patients, uh, including those who are many many who are taking beta blockers. I have a question uh, about allergies because I know that quite a few people can't wear either watches or straps because of allergies. I don't know if you know any products or types of products where you avoid that problem. Go ahead, Todd. Again, you got this. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I've, I've run into that a couple of times. Thankfully, it's it's not it hasn't been super common in my patients uh, because, but I do know it's an issue. Um, the using using sampling based on just putting your finger on the optical scanner of your phone using an app that will run that can get around that. So you're not using a wearable; you're just putting your finger on your phone. Um, and that that can be helpful. Um, you, you don't get the benefit of real time sampling or real time measurement, um, so you can't really go back and check. Um, but it's it's certainly better than nothing. Um, I've had another person who was able to take their blood pressure, um, and so they would take their blood pressure multiple times during the day to get, just get the heart rate number. Uh, and then there's always you can always do it manually using a carotid pulse um, and just count it out. Uh, which is which is sort of the way we used to do it before <laughs> before all these fancy apps and straps came about. So um, so a few few different uh, more hypoallergenic aller options there. There's one question here that I uh, you probably have no really good answer to it, but it's something that comes up again and again and again in these things we do about pacing and energy management and. That's the question, what do I do when I have no choice? When the demands on you in daily life are so great that you can't possibly keep within uh, your resting heart rate plus 15. How do you do it as best as you can within when not doing it perfectly? Is it possible even to answer? Um, well, as a physio, I, I always try <laughs> because that's that's our wheelhouse. And um, so the first answer is absolutely. Sometimes you just can't. 
Uh, sometimes you have to do that trip. Sometimes you have to visit that person. Sometimes you got to go to the store. If you're severely involved, um, you got to get to the bathroom. Um, and, and that, that may be just sort of a daily, that may be the daily exertion. And, and I think there's still a role, right? Biofeedback, even in things that you have to do, because it allows, it allows you to make an informed decision. Um, what heart rate, I think biofeedback does is it, is it gives people information to be able to save up energy for the things that they need to do uh, as best they can so that they can make informed choices about the future because you have information about what the different um, activities and activity uh, activities will do to to your body in terms of how how hard it exerts. So at least you can you can make those decisions. Um, again, some decisions are unavoidable. so so rationing energy is possible. Uh, but then also, I think just the validation that you're making an informed choice instead of living from crash to crash, there's there's something to that as well that you you, you know it's happening, um, and you're you're going to do something about it when you can, uh, and that that that's just not always possible. So that's the first answer, and then the second answer I have is um, this is where the health coaching comes in because sometimes there are ways to help save energy. So this is. This is the only thing I have in common with financial advisors. Do not, you know, so, so this is not financial advice. But what financial advisors always tell you is to pay yourself first. So you want to make sure that you save some money uh, for a rainy day, in a retirement, in a whatever. And so um, I always advise people, if you have a little energy, make sure to pay yourself first. Uh, put yourself first. It's okay to say no. Um, and to, to be able to validate that as a, as a legitimate choice. And if it feels like at first you're saying no to a lot of things, it's because you are. Um, but it's in the hopes of um, better energy and better function uh, in the time ahead. Todd, I like that. I like that answer to that question. I just uh, wanted to add one thing about just that, that period of time where you know you're going to overdo it and there's just no way around it. I heard Stacy answer a question like that using an example of a credit card. Sometimes you you might not have money, but you need to get something, and so you utilize a credit card. Um, just recognize when that's happening, there's going to be a payback. When you use a credit card, there's going to be an interest rate that is difficult to pay back. And that what that reminds you is, if you do need to use that, minimize its use as much as possible because of the payback. And just in addition to what Todd said, you know, there is life things. Um, try try to avoid denying your illness altogether or thinking that it's going to get better by overdoing it because it's not. But when you do have to overdo it, recognize that you're going to need to allow time to rest and recover so that you can pay that back um, to, to avoid getting worse. Um, I, I could do a case example of a friend of mine that just uh, she fought her illness to the end rather than cooperating with her body. She fought it. And uh, the result was she continually got worse rather than continually got better. So um, it's it's just a realization of the illness. That's why I like the answer, Todd. I have always thought that one benefit of when I used the heart rate monitor myself was the alarm when I went above my heart rate and my whole family heard it <laughs> which meant that uh, i had some kind of objective thing that said that now i have to rest it's beeping i have to rest rather than me just having to say that oh i'm tired again you know which feels a lot worse so for me that was actually a help of making other people aware of when I was starting to get tired and when I needed to rest. So um, that was a good thing of it. We are starting to get towards the end of the hour, but I was wondering, you have been looking at the questions in the Q&A. Is there anything there you want to answer? And you think that any subject we haven't touched on? Todd, while you're thinking about that, um... True, you just mentioned that your alarm, your whole family hears. And I think there, probably most of us on here have ME. I think it's very, very helpful if you do have ME that your significant people around you, whether it's your children, your spouse, your partners, uh, good friends, also understand your illness. Uh, they understand what you're struggling with. Uh, if they're willing to help you uh, adhere to that, it can be a lot easier rather than having a friend or family member that that doesn't understand the illness and and says, no, 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 you, you can do this. Um, 
just like many well-meaning physical therapists, you know, we can train you out of this illness. They understand the illness. They're going to understand when that alarm goes off, it has consequences for you. Um, and I think that can be very, very helpful. Yes. The, uh, the question is finding in, um, you said there was an app that you could use that had an alarm, a heart buddy or something like that. Was it? Yeah. I, I've been using this free app called heart buddy. It, it pairs with, um, Garmin, and I'm just thinking off the top of my head, so I could be wrong here. It does pace with Polar products. It doesn't pace with Apple Watch. It doesn't pair with Apple Watch. Apple Watch requires, there is an app that's a paid app, but I will, I'll mention that there's a um, the development of a of an app in this space uh, and, and hardware in this space um, that uh, that's really exciting. Part of the problem with, with, with contemporary wearables is that they're geared towards people who, um, who exercise. Yes. Uh, and so, um, that you can see where that's a problem, um, in terms of how to set, uh, how to set the app, uh, the alarms that, that it is life becomes a training zone. <laughs> so you have to think about your whole life as training. Uh, and so we're, we're, we're usually trying to get people sort of out of that, out of that mindset and into an energy conservation mode. But, um, the, the app and hardware is from a company called visible. Um, and so really looking forward to seeing what that product looks like, because it's built with the um, needs of patients uh, in mind, you're kind of really viewing energy conservation as 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 an important lifestyle uh, instead of sort of a a, a, th a thing that gets added on in 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 another app using uh, ex using exercise and fitness as the background. I would like to ask something to end at the end, which is, do you? Do courses for physicians or physiotherapists in on this subject something that people from, for instance, Norway could join, so we could go to our doctors and therapists and say that you know go here and and look at this and uh, and learn. The um, so the QR code in uh, the, the the question. Uh, slide and also at the at the beginning leads to the workwell website we have recorded webinars uh there uh different presentations uh we have material up on medbridge uh for providers uh that especially physical therapists occupational therapists nurses athletic trainers uh, can all access um i know that we've done over 20 presentations this year alone uh on uh, various topics related to post-exertional malaise, uh, energy system first aid, heart rate biofeedback to to various provider and patient groups. So we're always happy to to do that. Uh, we do uh, we do webinars uh, through through Workwell, um, and so watch for those. We try and get to them uh, every quarter. Uh, <laughs> we're we're going to be more regular about that in the future. Uh, so there will be additional opportunities. But if there's a specific need that you see or a group that you would like to reach, please do reach out to us at. Uh, at, at our uh, at our email address um, uh, that's on the uh, the question the question slide. Okay, unless there's uh, I know you have answered um, some of the questions directly. Um, there are a lot here. I, I apologize to everyone where we haven't covered your questions. I don't know if there's anything either Mark or Todd have noticed in the questions that you think we haven't covered that we should have covered? Lots of great questions. I think we've covered most of them. Certainly, please reach out to us through our email address if we didn't get your get to your question uh, and you'd like to have it answered. Uh, we don't we want to make sure that we accommodate everyone. So uh, thanks mm -hmm. for your patience. OK, well, then I'll just have to say thank you to both of you. It's been great and uh, very grateful for you joining us here today and uh, also thank you to everyone who's joined and watched and asked questions and um, I think we all learned a lot so um, thank you thank and you thank you for having us and goodbye bye bye bye